Okay, um, welcome to this week's Farm Business Options webinar. Um, we're coming to you today from Chagas in Cork West, and we have three very interesting speakers lined up with a mix of um, food and uh, tourism uh, from farm diversification. So um, we have Johnny Lynch from McCroom Buffalo Farm. Um, you might recognize him from the Aldi ad when he was up in the top of the buffalo. Um, we have David Ross from Top of the Rock Pod Park and Walking Centre in Jim League. And we have Alan Kingston from Glen Island Farm um, Dairy Products. So um, they're, they're a great range of speakers and um, I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions for them. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you might ask them through the chat function and um, we'll try and answer as many questions as possible. So after each speaker, um, we will um, have um, a short questions and answers session and we will also have more time for questions at the end. And just to introduce myself, my name is Anya Reardon. I'm a joint stock advisor based in McCroom and I'm joined by my colleague Seamus Lorden, who's a dairy advisor based in McCroom and um, we will be hosting the meeting today. So Seamus, if you'd like to introduce Johnny and Johnny, if you wanted to turn on your camera and unmute. Okay, well, look, as Anya said, we're lucky we have three excellent speakers here today. And first up is uh, Johnny Lynch, uh, McCroom Buffalo Farm. Now I suppose Johnny, he was, a, he was originally a dairy farmer uh, milking 40 Frisian cows back, um, I suppose in 2009. But the milk price dropped, I think, around 19 cents a litre that year. And Johnny thought maybe there's something else he can do. So, you know, it was a big, um, I suppose, it was a big change. But in October that year, he bought 31 buffalo uh, from northern Italy. And that was the start of uh, the McCroom Buffalo Farm. Um, I suppose then in 2015, he established the McCroom Buffalo Cheese with Kieran Moylan. They set up uh, a purpose-built cheese factory and soon received the highest quality certification in food quality and won many awards, including, I suppose, they won the gold award for um, in the World Cheese Awards. Now, it, it has grown and grown since, and I suppose currently they're milking over 500 cows across three farms. So, Johnny, over to you. Um, I think it's you they want to listen to, so um, we'll sh share the screen, I think, anyway, on you. Hi all. Um, so we started out in 2009 really and um, the reason why we changed was for the low price of milk. Um, couldn't see no future really for the next generation coming on. Um, we had an opportunity to be first. And um, you know a lot of the reason was that farming was becoming very lonely too. You wouldn't see anyone calling to the farm. To you, when you're only milking 40 or 50 cows, you can't afford to employ a man. So you do it all yourself. So the only man you see really is the milkman that calls to collect the milk. And if he calls before seven or eight in the morning, you won't even see him. So anyway, we switched and we went from there. Um, why I was suited really was because we had a milking parlor we had land and um, we looked at sheep for a while but if we went down the milking sheep route we would have had to change the fencing we would have had to change the parlor Do you know the parlor would be too big a course housing and also on top of that we didn't know anything about sheep and like i know that the water buffalo we didn't know anything about them either but we would have been forced at it and that brings a lot of um, good, but also if you want to find out anything about them, you have to get on a plane and go. Um, so we um, we had to do a lot of research. First, we went to first we went to Wales and we milked the animals there for a week. Um, that went fine. We were over with a lady called Alison Clark. She was milking 104 animals and she was drawing the milk in four hours away where the milk was made into cheese. Um, we went from there, we traveled to Italy and 
numerous times to 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 see cheese plants as well as farms, but it was all indoor over in Italy. There's very few that have mountain grass. So from there we learned an awful lot. Um the next place we went to then was trying to establish whether the Irish people would like cheese. So you have to look into how much mozzarella is being imported into Ireland, which wasn't a very easy thing to do, um, but you would get rough ideas from looking up certain places. Um, then you have to hope that the Irish people will support you, which they have, and they're great, unreal good, the way they support Irish cheeses and anyone that do anything, they really support them. Um, so then along with, we only had mozzarella in our mind, at that stage kind of thing, but we also travelled to Greece, all over Europe, really. Um, so then we had to look at grant aid, which is a huge part of anyone's anyone that's starting up. Um, the Udras is the place where we went to. Udras were great, very helpful. Um, a lot of farm filling, that is for sure. And um, but at the end of the day, if you have someone that that knows how to fill farms, it's really worth worth in effort because very hard to get going without help, especially financial help. Um, we have a wide range of people we supply to: Aldi, Musgraves, Tesco, Duns. Max and Spencer's, Harrigan's, um, call to our yard three or four times a week. So they delivered the stock for us. Um, Lilliput, West Cork Olives, um, Palace Foods are also there, but we deliver to all them really. Um, plans for the future. We have three farms going, as as we were talking about earlier on. So we have about five to five fifty animals in, in total. Um, them three farms now are starting to fill up. So we have to find someone else to start farming them, and we have to go into making new cheeses, maybe yogurts, maybe blue cheese. You know, there's plenty of stuff out there. We have a lot of research done in them in the last two or three years. Um, so plenty to look forward to for 21 anyway. Um, we have planning, we're after applying for planning to extend our plant. So I'll go. Um, would I do it all again? If you asked me that in 2014, I would say no. Um, I, was in, I was in another partnership up to then. And after five years, we still weren't making any money. Um, I really think after three years, if you're not making any money, you should seriously look at things because if they haven't improved by then, they probably won't. Um, if you ask me now, I would say yes. Um, everything is starting to make sense with the last three years. Um, so I see the future now as good. Um, the jobs, you, you wake up every morning and there's plenty of jobs, there's plenty of different things. Um, there's cheese, there's milk, there's meat. There's employing people, which is a completely, you'd nearly want to take up a course as well to handle people that you employ. Um, where do we go from there? If I had any advice to give to anyone, it is relationships. It is like when you talk to the people in Aldi or Musgraves or anywhere, you're building relationships all the time. If the relationships are good, you'll you'll always be able to ring them up if you have any hassle or anything, and if the relationships aren't good, you can't. So I'd say you, you have all my say there for now. Um, so that's it. Perfect, John, thanks. Um, so if people want to put in the chat function, any questions that you may have, uh, just the first question there, Johnny, in terms of farming cattle and buffaloes, what do you see yourself as the biggest difference between milking cows and buffaloes? 
Well, number one, anyway, you couldn't um, a hedge or anything that would go over a hedge like it wasn't even there. So you have to have an electric fence around everything. Um, if you have gates, you have to have them with extra strong locks because they will open gates like they weren't even there. Um, milking them is most certainly a kind of a different challenge completely. If they don't want to leave out the milk, they won't. Um, in general, they do, but they can throw themselves in the ground and then you can't milk them, that's sure. But after a while, it, it comes easier. Um, Roll-ups with the animals is the only hassle they have really. Calving is no hassle, but they can prolapse. Um, so prolapse is the biggest issue, but we're, we're coming around it as well. Insemination was also very hard for the first few years, but with the last 12 months, we've really come around it as well. And we, you know, 20% insemination now, I'd say we'll have in calf, which is very good yeah. compared to before. You'd be lucky to have two. Yeah. So it is all different. You know, when you spend a lot of time with something, after the first two years, I thought I kind of knew everything. But every time you think you know everything, you you really get a hop and something else happens again and you know that you don't know everything. Every day is a learning day. Yeah. But it's yeah. more certain, it's easier, like. Question is there about poor flows? Are they docile or do they get cross? Yeah, I was, there was a way more than cross first, but the more the ones that were born here seem to be a way more friendlier, a way more easier to handle. They're kind of Norway, where the ones that came from Italy and Germany, um, they didn't, you know, they were used to being housed. Um, yeah. So once they're born here, it's, it is easier, a lot. Um, 10 months in a week, the animals are in calf, so you're doing well to get in a, a calf year. But there's a lot of small things now that I wouldn't even think as something where in the first year I would, because I would have been used to freesians, you know what I mean? Um, you, you can walk after an animal, fine, because they can't kick you back. They can only kick forward, which is very unusual because a freesian cow, you'll always stand away back from them. Um, just small things. Um, they So inside in the parlor, they can't kick you back really like. They can hop all right, but they can't kick you back with their tails or the weapons. And Johnny, um, how long did it take you to get um, used to the animal and get to know him? You know? I was three years. Three years. Okay. I, it, it did really like, yeah, you know, the first year you'd be very much afraid. Um, I remember Kieran, my son, then he, he wasn't afraid of them, so he was going to them all the time, but their, their strength is huge. So he came in one day and he was black and blue from his hip up because he went in with him, but he couldn't come out and they were all scratching at him. So their strength is fierce, but they're in general, they're friendly animals and they want to be scratched and like almost hugged. So they're not afraid for like the moment with the coronavirus. You must stay away from all. Uh, another question there. How was learning how to make cheese? So how did you first learn and how? That was you... huge because I didn't know anything at all, but we were, we were very lucky to get um, Sean Ferry that had years and years of experience. But when we went over to Italy first, I went over there for two weeks learning cheese. And when we came home that I thought I knew everything about cheese. And the first three months of milk was thrown away. When I say milk, the milk wouldn't turn into cheese because our milk was extra clean in comparison to Italy. And you need more starters then to get that going. But um, of course, every time it failed, we only cleaned more. So do you know what I mean? But when we, we had an expert in then for about a week and a half, and then, do you know, after a year or two, things would settle down a bit, yeah. Okay. But it's a huge step. Cyprus and Greece, we also went there, and we, we learned how to make Greek cheese, and we learned how to make halloumi. And until you go outside of Ireland, really, for the different cheeses like it's you won't know any other way because there isn't anyone here to really show you yeah. okay and it's very hard to to compete with the cheese from italy and from these kind of countries because their labor is fierce cheap in com comparison with ireland our labor is still dear uh, do you know what i mean like the wages we pay here are higher than out there 
And and Johnny, just I'd say one more question before we finish. Is there? It's just about the grants. What grants are available for a startup company? Did you? Sure, Udras are, are huge. Udras tusks were huge, but if you're not in the in, in the yeah. Irish area, then if you're not inside in the Gaelic the area, there's IRD there, which are equally as good. Um, like there's employment grants, there's machinery grants, but you have to apply for all these before you go for them. Uh, do you know what I mean? If you employ someone first and if you don't tell them about it, you're too late in like. So it takes a time too for to get your head around that. Um, Percentage wise then is on machines. Um, But there's five to 10,000 for an employee for year one, which is huge. So if you yeah. employ someone, you get, you get five to 10,000 on year one. So it really takes um, a lot of strain out of it. Yeah, but the, the, the Udras grant was a massive help to you. It was, it was, yeah. And it is like relationships again. When you build relationships with them, it's huge. Yeah. Um, because once you um, start talking to them, you know, you're ringing them in about stuff and they're helping you also along the way because they've been in, in other places. And yeah. Yeah. about um, relationships again, about the... Department of Ag even. You know, if you build good relationships with him, the Department of Ag are actually good people and a lot of people wouldn't would wouldn't agree with me there, but they actually are. Yeah. Um, if they see that you're making an effort, they they would they will help you, like. Yeah, of course. Um so just look at the time, there's loads of questions in, but we'll move on, I suppose, um, just to, to give the others a chance and hopefully we'll yeah. come back and, and answer more of the questions at the end. Perfect. Great stuff. So Seamus, over to so, you. Yeah, thank you. Um thanks, Johnny. And we'll move on now. So the next person to speak is going to be David Ross. Now, David is, as Anya said, it's Top of the Rock, Pod Park and Walking Centre. Uh, David and Elizabeth Ross, they run this. Um, I suppose it's based in Drimley, County Cork, the heart of West Cork. And I suppose really, it's another story of diversification. They started off with 48, the 48 acre suckler farm and they were wondering what can they do? And they've converted it really into, they're still the suckler farmers, but they've also convert into a I suppose award winning glamping center. Um, they're very, I suppose, uh, eco sustainable ethos is still uh, very strong on the farm. Um, they do great walks and I, I suppose there's there's a big variety of animals there. As they said they have donkeys, goats, sheep, uh, sheep and ducks, and as well as Daisy the dog. David, we can't forget Daisy the dog. I suppose is very important. And look, it all works. It's it's location. It's it's the people. It's everything, and that has created I suppose a a unique a unique spot there for educational fun holidays for. I suppose for families, couples, and walkers alike, really, I would say, David. So, look, over to you, David, and I'll let you start your presentation. So, thank you, David. Thank you very much indeed, Seamus and Anya. And it is a, it is a great privilege to be invited to be um, on the Tagish Options. Um, and thank you, Johnny, for a great talk. It is very hard to follow that, I'll tell you. And so it is. Uh, but I'll do my best. Um, right, I suppose. Um, it is true to say that uh, we, we opened up in 2013 and uh, since then there hasn't a month passed uh, that someone wouldn't either ring or come uh, or visit or stay the night and they would their, their story would be we would like to set up a glamping center or whatever in our farm you know so I suppose we're well used to um, trying to help people to kind of uh, get their heads around what it would take to, to set up something like this. So therefore, the little presentation I put together uh, actually comes in the form of um, the questions that, that the, the questions that people would ask if they came here. And I'm putting uh, myself and my wife Elizabeth, we're putting, we're actually kind of telling the story from the point of view of what we, how we would answer those questions um, seven years ago when we were starting, do you see? So uh, we're at the top of the rock, Pod Park, uh, Oscar Eiliga, uh, and Walking Centre, and we're in Drimley, and that's our website there, topoftherock.ie. Um, so I suppose I'm just moving on here now 
to get to the first uh, screen if I can, and it's a little bit slow. Effectively, I suppose we are, um, we, uh, this might help it now, um, and if it doesn't, there's no great panic. The, the questions that we would be, um, uh, I'll see if I can stop sharing and get back to the, um, back to the thing again, and I'll, I'll have another go at it. I suppose the first question we would ask ourselves is, um, where are you situated? Um, so I'll just send you that, that, that picture there now. Um, so effectively, well, okay, what is your idea? Um, and our idea was this, that uh, we had uh, a lovely old farmyard. There we are, that's better, isn't it? Um, our idea was to reinvent an old farmyard to become a glamping and uh, walking accommodation centre. So the story of this place is that um, my grandfather, Sam Ross, came here. He didn't come from only a mile away, but he came here 100 years ago and he set up this little farm. And um, basically a lot of his little his little houseians, uh, we would say in West Cork, his little houses like the car house and the duck's house and the cow house and the stable. I remember what all those were like when I was small. And uh, we, we tried to reproduce the little farmyard that he had, if you understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, so in order to make it, a, a glamping centre. So therefore, you can see the pods there in the background. We 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 purchased those and um, made it. So I suppose I'd say to you, what is your idea? This was the idea we started with, right? And it uh, certainly it has worked. Now, the next big question is where are you located? And uh, from, from our point of view, as you can see here in the map, we're in Drimaleague. And uh, Drimaleague is way over here. And... Um, the Sheep's Head is a lovely long peninsula here for walkers and the Sheep's Head Way is a very famous walking, uh, walking route all the way from the Sheep's Head to Bantry. But the eastern part of it comes on out here uh, to Drummondy and then up to all the way to Gugan Barra, which is the way above here. So we are very centrally located in the heart of West Cork. We're only half an hour, you could say, from Clankilty, half an hour from Glengariff, uh, 20 minutes from Skibbereen and 12 minutes from Bantry. So you see, um, where are you located is very important. And from our point of view, being an accommodation centre, the fact that we were so near to the lovely little village of Drummond League, where it has a great um, centre and, uh, you know, a, a public houses, post office, chemist shop. It's just, a, and three lovely churches. It's, it's a lovely little centre. And it, at the same time, there's only one hour from Cork. So where are you located? I suppose the next question, you would ask if you were planning a venture, something like that, would be, who have you with you? Well, I thank God for my wife, Elizabeth, here in the middle. And uh, she's, a, she's a, a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, uh, co-conspirator, I suppose you could say, in terms of setting up something like this. Also a great cook and a, a, a wonderful heart for um, being hospitable and open to people. And then our daughter, Joanna, who is training to be a teacher in Mary I, she is with us all during the summer and of course she's with us at the moment as well. So that's our team. And of course, we have four other children and we've got a few grandchildren and they love coming here as well. Now, so I suppose the next question, what are your strengths, right? And I suppose in our case, uh, our strengths, uh, if we had strings, we, you could say were all the things that go to do with farming, animal husbandry. I was uh, farming suckler cows since 1986 uh, on a small farm of 48 acres. Uh, over the years, we we rented four other farms and built up the sucklers. And uh, But it, there came a point where you couldn't keep going with sucklers on rented ground. And we said, look, we better come back and just focus on the 48 acres that we have and do something with it. So that was how that came about. What other strengths did we have? I suppose we had creativity, the ability to build stone walls, the ability to see potential in a place and to see how you could develop something into something beautiful. As you can see from the background there, in my behind the background picture to myself, we're located in an absolutely beautiful place overlooking the Castle Donovan Hills. And we have a lovely river down at the bottom of the farm. People skills, uh, yes, I, I had been involved for, I have been involved all my life really with the church and uh, when you're involved with the church uh, you really uh, have people skills and inviting people to your home 
and hospitality becomes such a lovely, important thing. Sadly, with COVID, it's it's a bit uh, it's not as easy, you know. Uh, photography, you need to be a fairly good photographer, all right. Marketing, you you need to be you'd be learning about it, uh, like like all the way. Hospitality and baking, and the ability to pass on uh, your your teaching skills, uh, and we do that with the with the children's um, programs that we have here as well on the farm. Now, so you could ask the question, what makes your farm attractive for this? Right. Well, as was, we had a story to build on. You have to build everything around the story and the story of my grandfather. Farm features, lovely features in the farm. The fact that it was eco and sustainable. I was probably the 19th person in County Cork to go into Reps in 1996. And ever since the farm has been a, a Reps uh, or Gloss or whatever it was, farm. And we have a walkway right around the farm uh, that was created with the, the under the walk scheme and people walk it all the time. And then there's a nice variety of farm animals. A few more pictures there. There's my grandfather, Samuel Ross, who um, came here 100 years ago. That's what he had. Uh, the, the, the horse called Paddy, and I remember that horse still. We keep lovely drumming, a few drumming cows. Uh, there they are, look, against the backdrop of the sky. And then at the bottom of our river, there's the, the, uh, at the bottom of our farm, there's the Island River. And a lovely river it is, flowing all the way out to Skibbereen. And uh, uh, under the walk scheme, um, we were able to develop a, a lovely bridge over it with the help of Sean O'Driscoll uh, of Glen Dimplex and who came from Drum League. And so wonderful uh, advantages like that. Now, the next question you would ask yourself is, you know, thinking of this, what support and help could we get? Well, like Johnny and um, the Uderos, it was us and West Cork Leader. The West Cork Leader had been very influential in uh, helping us to create the network of nine miles of walkways in Drummer League. Uh, leader gave great help and advice and support, €100,000, into that project for the walkways. And once the walkways were there, their plan was this, that you and, you and they would invest in public infrastructure and then they would look for private individuals to actually build on that to supply what was needed. And there was need for a walking centre and some form of accommodation. And so therefore, they asked us, would we be interested? And sure, we had a few ideas and we went to England to look at some pods and we stayed overnight in England in 2012 for a couple of nights in a pod. And you know something? We felt this is something that might work in West Cork. And thank God it has worked. Um, uh, so Leader, Leader actually gave us a very substantial grant. Uh, what we built here, what you can see, including the, the, the main building that we built, uh, a total of uh, 450,000 euros was spent. Of that, leader granted us 200,000. Now that was a remarkable thing and only for them, we could not do it. So, we're, But by the same token, every person that comes here, they spend money, they leave money all around West Cork in restaurants and shops and, uh, and the, you know, Clannock Kelsey and Kinsale, they'll visit all those places. So that money that, that leader spent is being... Um, it's been recouped every day of the week with the people who come here and spend their, their, their family holiday money in West Cork. So we're thankful to Leader. AIB were very helpful as well in helping us to get a loan. We had to take out a substantial loan of 180,000 to cover the thing. And, you know, we're still working away on that, trying to, trying to finish off paying it. Fall to Ireland have been remarkable. And of course, in 2015, we won the Irish tourism industry. We were we got recognition there for um, for best environmental tourism innovation. So moving on from there, uh, let me know on you if I'm moving beyond the time. I, the clock uh, isn't. Yeah, uh, maybe another minute or two. Yeah, another minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you think will avail of what you provide? In our case, it happens to be uh, families from Cork City and County. Seventy percent of the people that come to this pod park are from Cork City and County. What motivates you to sacrifice so much to make this a reality? I suppose number one, people's enjoyment, uh, work satisfaction. Uh, you have something to leave to your family. It's, there's community good attached to it. And also the fact that for us, we felt a sense of calling. We felt it was set before us to do, if you understand what I mean. And, and that made it very special. So the challenges of 2020, of course, COVID, uh, 
you know, we have, we have a good few people signed up to come after Christmas. Whether they can come now is very debatable, uh, very doubtful, I would think. Adjusting to change, finding new ways to attract people. Our farming enterprise is about 30 suckler cows. There they are. Um, the animals are so important. Uh, uh, Seamus listed them out already, but look there, <laughs> there's a few donkeys. There's vortable sheep, ducks, bantams, white doves, and of course, daisy. And I suppose one thing I want to say at the end of this presentation is that farm hands, our daily farm tour is something very special uh, where we take families, um, uh, parents and children uh, around in this little wagon here. And uh, we give them an hour and a quarter uh, around the farm, looking at feeding the animals, maybe feeding lambs out of a bottle or little kid goats. Uh, we do um, have a bale maze. We have this hayride. We tell them all about the history of the farm. We go to see the tree goats, the goats who live in trees, Maria, and we do milk the cow. And uh, then we have a certificate at the end of it. So that's a little thing called farm hands. And you know, that would work for any farm, I think. Um, it's, it's a lovely little thing. So Anya, without further ado, I am going to hand back to you. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, David. Um, I think there's people on this webinar from all over Ireland, so hopefully you might have a few visitors that might call to you after um, COVID. Um, so we have a few questions in there. Um, the first one is, um, did the walking trails exist before the development of the pods or um, did you develop the walking trails? Well, we'll put it this way. I, I went to a course uh, run by Leader in 2006 called uh, oh, The Sustainability of Local Heritage or something like that. And um, I spent the winter doing that. And we then had to, we had to provide some kind of a project at the end of that. And, and my project was that we'd try and make a walk down along the Island River between my farm and the farm of or your next uh, the person that you're interviewing next my half brother alan kingston and so therefore uh, the walks were created by a local community group yes i was the joint chairperson along with a wonderful lady called kathleen Keane, and the walks were put in place there's nine miles of walks in drum league it's a fantastic place to come walking six of those miles are off off um, the road on private lands and it's supported by the walk scheme which was which was initiated by the IFA um, back in 2007. So, yes, the walks were there before we started. Yeah, um, David, just one question there. Your business, is your website very important for your type of business? And where does your repeat business come from then, David? Um, if I... Website is fierce important. Uh, it is, uh, Seamus, because that is the portal, really, where everything else flows to. Now, we have a really good web designer and he has drawn in the Instagram, the, um, the uh, Facebook, the Twitter, everything. He's drawn the whole thing into it. So when you go to our website, you're able to click on a little button which says book a pod and it'll bring you straight to a booking engine. So we don't believe in booking.com or any of those guys. We keep away from all of them. Everything is done directly. Do you get me? Yeah. And there's a, an agency in, in um, Scotland called Free to Book, and they're a brilliant agency for, for doing bookings that avoid all these um, direct um, whatever they are. Yeah. So, look, that works very well for us. The website, fierce important, and good pictures are very important. Thank you, David. Um... We just have a few comments in of people who have been visited you in the past and they were very impressed and got a very warm welcome. So there's a lot of nice comments there as well, David. But I'll pass that on to my wife because she's, uh, she's marvellous. Yeah. Uh, just one final question. So, Dave, before maybe we go on, there will be more, but we'll just have one more maybe. How important is local buy-in and cooperation from neighbours, uh, you know, and adjoining landowners, you know, to the public concept uh, in a project like that? Absolutely it... vital. And the whole community of Drummer League are, are really behind us in this um, in this venture. Number one, with the walkways, and number two, with the top of the rock. It it has brought a great deal of life to Drummer League, and indeed it has helped the other bed and breakfasts as well, you know, in Drummer League, because uh, people, people, a family might stay with us, but their ageing grandparents might choose to stay in the B&B &B in Drummer League. Do you know what I mean? And so it has also helped Glen Allen Farm and uh, oh, it's community 
buy in. That's what it's all about. But the whole the walk system or the the walk scheme. There's 15 particip- 15 farming partic- farmers participating in the Drummond League area, and really to them it's a great boost. And you know what what um, what was mentioned earlier there um, about farming being a kind of a lonesome occupation that you wouldn't see anyone. Um, you know, for all those participants and for ourselves, we're definitely not lonely. Well, we're lonely, no, because the, with the COVID we couldn't have people. But, um, you know, it's lovely to have people coming to see your farm and you'd be thankful to God for what you have and for the gift of creation and going out and walking in it. And to share that with other people is just such a blessing. Do you get me? Perfect. I think that's a good way to finish off for the moment. And uh, we, we have a lot of questions, as, as we say, coming in, but I think um, we'll hold them now until afterwards again, Anya. So we might move on to Alan, I think, if that's okay. So just a few words, a small introduction about Alan there. And oh yeah, thank you, David, by the way. Thank you very much, David. And we'll, right. we'll, we'll be talking to you again in here. But um, Alan, I suppose, look, uh, Alan Kingston and his wife Valerie set up Glen Ellen Farm in 1998. Look, they were, everyone has seen them now, I suppose. They're nearly in every retail shop, I think, in uh, around the country. Um, they set up, I suppose, in 1998. They start going to, around to farmers' markets, Alan, and has expanded a lot since. So, um, look, they've won a lot of awards. They're, they're in every retailer across the country now and also they're exporting roughly around 20 percent of their product to the uk so look alan you have a great story as well to tell as well as uh, johnny and david so look i'll hand it over to you there now dave or uh, alan thank you thanks so much guys and uh, it's really nice to um <clears throat> be able to share a bit of a story about uh Dylan and farm i really enjoyed listening to david there and, and johnny especially johnny because uh, in the food business i can identify with everything that he said in terms of starting up and so on and so forth. So um, I just flicked through a few slides, I suppose, just to give you a bit of an idea of, um, of maybe how we started and where we are maybe today. So this is, this is actually outside of the, of the dairy, uh, just to give you an idea of its location and so on and so forth. Um, some of the products that we make, so a generally soft dairy product, um, it's a range of desserts, yogurts, butter, creams, and so on and so forth. Uh, I suppose one of the issues in Ireland is that it's a relatively small population. So because it's a small population, you end up actually doing a whole range of products um, rather than maybe featuring on one particular or two particular lines because you, you're you struggling maybe to get volume overall. So. It's easier probably to make a whole range of products um, rather than, than focusing on one or two lines. So, um, yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of a background maybe of how we started off. So I was your typical dairy farmer, small farm, 59 acres, uh, farming with my dad, milking about 50 cows. Um, left school when I was 15, couldn't get out of it fast enough, couldn't get home to the farm fast enough, love to go out in the morning and bring in the cows and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> I suppose then uh, got married in 1997 and kind of, I suppose, discovered that actually, well, the, the farm we're, you know, farming here is quite small. We probably need another income. Uh, Valerie, who's, um, had a, a background in dairy science from UCC. Um, I suppose I always said, you know, I didn't have any education, but for those of us who don't have a lot of brains, maybe the best thing to do is to marry someone with them. So that, that's what that's what Valerie had. She had a bit of a background in dairy science and uh, came to the farm. We started off with no intentions, I suppose, of starting a business or anything like that. Um, family came along and then uh, I remember her taking a bit of milk from the bulk tank and making a bit of yogurt and making a bit of cheese, soft cheese. And I just couldn't believe, you know, that you could make a product from our milk. I don't know maybe what I was thinking, but I always kind of thought maybe that it had to be the factory. It had to be a big operation. It had to be, you know, somebody else to process what you produce uh, in terms of an ingredient. So I think, um, for some strange reason, I kind of never understood that a farmer could actually make um, a dairy product. So we started making some products in the kitchen. 
And then uh, I remember t- saying to Val one day, oh, the, the fridge was full of pots of yogurt and jars of this and that and the other. So I said, look, give it away or sell it or do something with it. So she marched off to the uh, farm, uh, the, the country market in Bantry, actually, with a few pots of yogurt. And um, I just uh, probably wanted to stay out of it because I kind of thought maybe you know, producing food on the farm or actually selling at a market now, for example, that was that was really for penny hippies. It wasn't really for me. It wasn't from a, just wasn't from, from a farmer, you know, because I, I wanted to think that I was just your traditional farmer. And uh, I, as you can see here in the photo, probably taken around the year 2000, I was forced into going to the market, actually, because uh, Valerie was off um, having her first baby, Sally. And of course, <laughs> she couldn't be at the market. So I was forced to go off and sell a bit of stuff. And as you, as you can see, it was a bit of a mess. The stand looked a bit odd and, and tumbled here, there and everywhere. But you know what? Like we were saying earlier, actually, I really started to kind of buy into the whole thing of, you know, you know, meeting people outside the farm, making a product from the milk from our cows and actually taking it and selling it to an end user. And that was a whole new ball game <clears throat> for me. So I really started to enjoy it, actually. And rather than being embarrassed about it, I actually started really by into it. So branding, I suppose, and telling your story is a really important kind of factor in all of this. And, you know, we've been through lots of different logos, especially in the early days. And what I can say about it is that it's really expensive. Um, well, probably it's actually really expensive when it doesn't work but it's actually really cheap when it does work. So if you invest a lot of money in it and it doesn't work, well then obviously that's not a good idea, but branding, I suppose, is really, really important and keeping it really, really simple. And uh, it evolves over time as well, um, just to, to reflect, I suppose, your ethos and what you do. Talking about ethos, I think it's really important actually that you, you know, jot down on a piece of paper actually all of the things that, that make you tick and make your, your brands tick. And for us, I remember doing this about, I'd say about 12 or 15 years ago, now we, we sat down and we kind of wrote down, jotted on paper, well, what are the things that make us get up in the morning? make yogurt, make the desserts and deal with consumers and, and bring maybe more people into our brand. And I think this was really helpful. I won't go through it all, but basically, you know, our values, uh, our personalities and, and what is it? The central thing about uh, Glen Ellen Farm for us is about producing authentic farmhouse products and farmhouse taste. But I think it's really important. And even like we have this uh, up on our, on our wall and reception, for example, so for us, it's not that we're perfect, definitely not, but that we remember uh, where we want to be or what we've set out to, to achieve eventually. Um, so I suppose our products are very clean. We like to think that they're very simple. Um, this here is uh, two shots of the ingredients of a supermarket private label cheesecake and the Glen Ellen Farm cheesecake. So it gives you an idea maybe in terms of um, you know, the type of deck that, that uh, we would be aiming for in terms of simplicity. And we try to think that they're, um, we aim at least that all of our products are really simple and that they're not complicated and uh, they, you understand actually what each ingredient is. We deal with a whole range of customers, uh, uh, all the main retailers in Ireland, I suppose. And uh, as Seamus mentioned earlier in the UK, we deal with the uh, a number of retailers there as well as Sainsbury's and Waitrose and um, lots of challenges dealing with retailers. They're fantastic. They account for, you know, 95% of our product going out into the market. We still go to a farmer's market every Thursday. Um, but retailers, you know, they're very, very valuable and we see them as partners. I think uh, maybe sometimes, especially maybe when we're small, and starting off, we see them as enemies, but actually uh, they're not enemies. They, they are partners in getting your product out to the market um, and out to consumers. So as Johnny was saying earlier, it's really important that you have good relations. Good relationships with your partners are really, really important. Um, sustainability, like every farmer, every business, it's a big part of our um, story here as well. And for three reasons, actually. One, 
it's 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 funny because with Val, you know, she wants to save the planet. For me, I want to save money, and the two kind of have to work together. Um, I do it because there's a financial uh, benefit. Uh, Val will definitely do it because there's um, a sustainable benefit. Uh, the two have to work together. There's no point in doing uh, lots of sustainable stuff if it doesn't make financial sense. So, and in often cases, seventy. Five percent of the time, you know, the sustainability will make financial sense, and that's that's where the balance is. It fits with our story, and I think actually the other thing, and especially uh, since COVID, you know, it promotes Ireland. We're all in this together. We're, you know, all trying to do our bit in our corner, and it is our civic duty. And especially at farmers, we have lots of responsibilities. Probably, as we all know, we've we've probably more responsibilities than most. Um, other sections of of, uh, of our communities. So I think we've lots of responsibilities to to do the right thing in terms of sustainability. Um, and Origin Green is a big part of that. Steps along the way. I'll just fly through these. So staying small or growing is really a a big question when you're starting off at a farmers market. You really have to decide: Do I want to go on or do I want to stay where I are? Define the principles. Um, like we were doing with our chart earlier, you know, really define what is it that makes Glenelg Farm different? What do I want to really stick to? Choosing the right people to come along the road with you on the journey, really important. Somebody put it to me once, he said, uh, uh, and it's not that I travel all that much, but would you, whoever you would be working with, would you spend your time sitting beside them on a flight to New York or Boston or whatever? Would you choose that? So people you get along with, I guess, are really important. And in our case, you know, we've really been good at delegating. That's one of the things we've been bad at lots of things, but delegating and bringing people on board and trusting them is really, really important. Learning to delegate, that's that's so important. So staying on the upward curve, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that a business has to keep growing. You've got to keep challenging yourself. If you, if you plateau and say you got there, well, then actually your business will start to go down the curve again. I think you've got to be decisive. You've got to be a leader. You've got to show your team, you know, this is the way forward and this is what we're going to do. And, and sometimes maybe you're not 100% sure, but you've got to be a leader and be confident in what you're doing. Um, I think this is really important, putting yourself in other people's shoes and especially with the retailers. You know, they've got shareholders, they've got margins to hit. Um, we can argue till the cows come home as to whether they're fair or not. Uh, but in the end of the day, we will always try and put ourselves in our buyer's shoes in terms of the targets that they have to meet. It's really important. Um, it's also important to recognize your limits. Um, for us, I think Val is good at this, actually. She keeps uh, she keeps the harness on and uh, whatever it is, um, in, in our situation, anyway, uh, the women that work in Glenelg Farm are definitely got a better gut feeling than, than men. I always trust what they have to say, so uh, fair play. And then I just want to very quickly just go through this. It's really been uh, the Borbia slide that I got years ago. A lot of people think that your brand has to do with everything that people can see. So this is like an iceberg. Uh, just above the water, you can see obviously the name, the brand identity, the logo. It's just all the things that you see about the business. Um, but actually, for us, it's really important that it's actually what people don't see really defines a brand. So it's things like your staff. How do you treat your staff? What about invoicing? Is it simple? Is it accurate? Um, training, uh, when somebody rings with a complaint or something, how are they treated on the end of the line? Uh, do you, are you on time for delivery? Um, are you meeting all the orders? So all of the stuff that people never see are actually define what your brand is all about. And I really think for any business and for any of us actually, it's the things that go on behind the scenes. It's not what people see it actually makes the difference, even though that's important, but it's what people don't see. That behind the scenes. So I think they're really, really important. I think that's everything. Uh, finishing off with a little side there of, of, of Sonia, who comes to the farm regularly to, to visit West Cork. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Alan. It's lovely to see that 
uh, I suppose you're supplying to lots of big supermarkets, but yet you still attend the farmers markets as well. So um, there's a variety there in what you do. Um, just to mention as well about the what you developed just in terms of a cafe and more visitor center, just for anyone who's visiting the area. Yeah, so I suppose, uh, you know, any, um, especially dairies and especially being in West Cork, you know, you, you have a lot of people during the summer who want to visit, even, even actually really more importantly, local people who want to visit and see maybe what's going on. So we decided to open a cafe. It's a pop-up cafe for about six to eight weeks of the year in the dairy here. People can come see production. We like to think that we're an open dairy. People can come anytime, actually. Um, obviously with COVID there's restrictions, but normally people can come and they can see production, they can see the products being made. Um, it's good for us actually because it keeps manners on us and uh, makes sure that we're not doing anything that we wouldn't be ashamed of or that we wouldn't people want people to see, you know. So that's one of the reasons and yeah, you can taste some good West Park food. Uh, so just a question there, Alan, maybe. Um, I'm just wondering, staff, you, you, you mentioned staff and how important it is. Did that take long to develop that skill to deal with them? Or is it, yeah. does it come natural? Um, it, I suppose you learn your skills, like everything you, you adjust. Uh, maybe, like, I mean, when we started off, sure, we didn't even know that, uh, you know, that uh, you get paid extra for bank holiday, for example, in a farm in the farming scene, you know it's it's very different. So you learn very very fast, and your staff will will um, definitely keep you, you know, on your toes and so on and so forth. I think uh, you know understanding again where people are coming from, you know, and putting yourself in their shoes actually is a really important factor. Um, you know, David listed out a, a, a very interesting list there in terms of the skills and. I, I'm a firm believer that you don't need to be, you know, brilliant at one particular thing, but you need to be just a little bit good at a lots of small things, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So if you're a brilliant marketeer, that's great, but that, that's just one tiny part of the business. You have to be, you know, pretty, you know, okay at lots of different areas and social skills, I suppose, and working with retailers and building relationships, um, and working with your staff and listening to them actually like every year for example yesterday we were doing our end of year reviews we'll meet everybody individually and just listen to see how they're getting along and um, ask them you know for feedback and so on so listening to your staff and understanding them is really important okay thanks david all right ellen will we bring them all back on on you yeah say. so uh, david and johnny if you want to turn on your cameras there and unmute So there's just a, a question there, throw it open to the three of you. Um, any advice for someone who is thinking of diversifying and starting up? Yeah. Johnny, yeah. maybe you have any comments? Um, I suppose research it anyway, first like, and you know, you have to research, research, research on there. And a lot of research would have to be done outside of the country, the way you're not competing with anyone in the country. Would you would, would you agree with me there, lads? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the people who are, um, who, who might come after you and maybe copy you as well, because look, um, in terms of the pods, you know, we were the probably the first slamping centre to open, but there's a few of them now, and it all helps the the, the pod uh, concept if there's more of them. So you have to be open open hearted. Yeah. I think for food, actually, when we started off, without spending huge amounts of capital, it's really important to test your concept. And I know it's difficult maybe in some areas, but for food, you know, there's hardly, you know, a town in the country in our cities at least where there isn't a farmer's market so with spending very little capital you can set yourself up um take your products and uh, even if you don't sell them yeah get them out get get customer feedback and listen listen to your customers you know and um that's really really important so i i think spending a lot of capital on a concept in the early days is really risky yeah 
growing slow and sustainable is, is much more beneficial than spending a lot of money in, on, on your concept, you know, before you know if the consumer wants it. I think that's some good advice there, lads. Thank you very much for that. Um, just, I, I think, Alan, I'm not sure there, there's one came in. Do you need to upskill a lot and where do you go to do this? That was a question. I, I think it's for you, Alan, as far as I know. Um, we're always learning. Um, learning from other people, actually. Um, I know for us, we have brought a guy on board uh, as a consultant. Um, he used to work with, with Kerry Foods and he's just got so many skills in terms of dealing with retailers and dealing with, I suppose, growth and, and challenges, I suppose, in every business. Um, so I think learning for me, it's about, it's about uh, you know, partnering with people who've been through what you're going through and who've learned from their experiences. And for us, uh, Dennis is a, is a brilliant um, support in terms of what we do. But yeah, you're always learning. Well, you, n you never get to the stage where you think you know it all. If you're, it's a dangerous place to be in. Yeah. Huge. Can, can I ask there, there's a question came in, I, I, I'll put it to David first. Um, David, where do you think you'll be in five years time? Or like, been, are you always thinking of something new or, or do you, well, is that in your mind? Um, I suppose we are trying to, uh, trying to work out how we'll pass it on to the next generation. But really, we have no intention of, of putting in more pods or making this place bigger because small is beautiful when it comes to this sort of thing. All right. Uh, it's those intimate, uh, you know, each little pot is its own little spot. I've, I've a, a half an acre there where the animals are. I could fill that with pods, but it would take the heart of the whole thing out of it, you know. So five years from now, um, probably expand uh, the whole idea of farm tours for, for tourists and for families and for schools. Uh, yeah, and uh, just look, the people who come to us are so loyal. They come every year. Some of them come twice a year. As I say, seventy percent of them are from are from within uh, an hour and a half of here, you know. So, and then the rest are before COVID, you know, from Germany, France, uh, and America and Canada. Yeah, that's right. Lovely. Very good, Johnny. There's just one question there. Do you export any cheese, or is it all sold in Ireland? No, we don't export any cheese yet. We have exported a very small bit to Scotland. Um, we had a lot of, um, about two or three years ago, we would have said we would be exporting no, but we're still short about 20% of cheese, even in the year we're in no. Um, so do we have a bit of homework done in Germany and England, but England, you just have to wait and see at the moment when you're not exporting there at this point, you wait and see, as far as I can see. I suppose, Alan, you would have more to kind of say in that, but... That's where we feel. Um, we definitely want to export in 2021, I think, maybe 22. Um, where would we see ourselves in five years? We would hope that there would be a couple of more farmers in milking and we'd be drying the milk in here and producing cheese here. Um, that's, that's where we would see the next four or five years going. Um, as Alan said earlier on, staying steady, it's an option. But when you're staying steady, you're going backwards. But at the same time, it all depends if you're happy in the, in the area you're in. Yeah. 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 I think, um, Very good. It's really important as well just to know that, you know, growing a company isn't always about turnover, actually. Um, there's lots of other areas that you can grow in, in terms of efficiency, bottom line profit, um, relationships, you know, I'd like to think that in five years time, of course, we all like to think that, you know, that uh, turnover is really important in terms of growth of company, but actually it's not everything. It's not, um, it's not the most important thing, actually. Uh, the most important thing is actually that we're sustainable and that, you know, we're making a profit. That's really important because if we're not making a profit, we won't be around in five years time. Uh, so that they're all the challenges, actually. It, it, it's not always about growing turnover. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Relationships are huge. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, product, well, your service and your product needs to be better, I guess, in five years time 
than it is now, you know. And yeah. once you start growing, Alan, and I'd say you would agree with me here, this is more to do with food, um, implying to people, the, the right people is huge. Because sometimes you're afraid to imply a person to take on this thing and all of a sudden you take them on and you're wondering why you didn't do it years ago, that they really fit the bill, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And delegating and trusting people. Like, it's a big yeah. challenge for small businesses, you know, to trust someone to bring on board, somebody new who maybe you don't know how they'll manage. But uh, we've found in our case, actually, that uh, a lot of the guys who we bring on board can actually do the job an awful lot better than we can do it. Uh, because they've maybe they have nothing else to maybe focus on. They just focus on one particular thing. And uh, You've got to delegate and trust them and, and let them at it. And uh, very often it's, it's, a, you know, it's a better option than you trying to do it yourself, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say. Perfect. Just look at the time there now and it's um, just gone 12 over the hour. So we might wrap it up with that. So again, just to thank um, the three speakers um, on behalf of Seamus and myself, uh, thanks to Johnny, to David and to Alan. Um, I think you gave three very interesting presentations and uh, we thank you for participating and we're very lucky to have such good examples of farm diversification here in, in the Chagas Cork West region. Um, so I suppose that's, that's it for the Farm Business Options webinar um, until January 21. And um, we wish everyone a, a happy Christmas and a safe Christmas. And um, thanks to everyone who joined. Um, I know people are probably busy Christmas week, but we had a good number of participants on today and it's, it's good to see. So thanks very much to, again to, to the three speakers and to Seamus as well. Thanks, okay. Thanks. Thank you very much.